Welcome to part three of this series. We'll pick up right where we left off with this beautiful image of diffuse and metallic spheres. To review, each sphere is instantiated with its center, radius, color, and its material. True means metallic and false means diffuse. If there is a hit, we set two properties on the hit record output parameter, how it's attenuated and how it's scattered, and send it out into the world. Dr. Shirley now introduces an abstract material class, instances of which implement a scatter method that will produce these two values. The scatter method takes two input parameters, a hit record and an incident ray. Attenuation and the scattered ray are output parameters. Note this method returns a bool. False means the incident ray was absorbed. We'll talk more about this shortly. As an aside, the equals default syntax is a feature from C++11, meaning to use a default destructor. And so here is our Lambertian material class. It has a private data member for albedo, and in its scatter method, we pass in the hit record. We set the scattered and attenuation output parameters and just return true. So now we'll create some Lambertian materials as smart pointers with color as their argument. And we'll update the sphere class's constructor to take the material's smart pointer instead of a color and that Boolean for metal or diffuse reflection. We'll simply add the material to the hit record when a hit occurs. The hit record doesn't need to record the attenuation and scattered ray anymore. The material will give us that when we call its scatter method. Note we forward declare the material class here. And here's where the rubber hits the road. If there's a hit, we'll create the two variables we're going to use and pass them in as output parameters to the material scatter method, along with the incident ray and the hit record. Generating our image, things look as expected. Note, I didn't bother with the fact that scatter returns a bool earlier, but I will now. If, as we will soon see, this returns false, we'll take that to mean the ray was totally absorbed by the material and we'll return the color black. Dr. Shirley then does something to deal with a potential bug. He checks if the reflected vector is close to zero in all directions. If so, he sets the scattered ray's direction to the normal. And that takes care of Lambertian surfaces. Let's now create the metal class. Metal also has an associated color, which is passed in. It's essentially the same as the Lambertian implementation, but we use our reflect method here to find the reflected direction. Note we are normalizing the incident ray. We'll create two of these metal material instances and pass them into the other spheres. We'll make them the same colors as before. Our image should now be the same as it was at the beginning. And it is. Now that we have these material classes, we've encapsulated their behavior and can add some interesting effects. For example, we'll add a fuzz factor to the metal material. As Dr. Shirley states, we can randomize the reflected direction by using a small sphere and choosing a new endpoint for the ray. The bigger the fuzz sphere, the fuzzier the reflections will be. We max out the radius of this sphere to unity. This is why we normalize the incident ray, so we can have a normalized reflected ray to add this random fuzziness to. Note that if the sphere is big or at grazing angles, it could be possible that the reflected ray goes below the surface. When this happens, we say the ray was absorbed. We return the dot product of the reflected ray and the normal to determine if the ray is absorbed. We'll update the constructor of the metal material to take the fuzz factor and use it to determine the scattered ray. You can see where we return the dot product. We'll generate our image again, 
giving the green sphere a small fuzz factor and the blue sphere the max fuzz size. We can see the effect at grazing angles. The blue sphere is definitely fuzzy, and we can see many absorbed rays. Generating again with higher resolution, we get this image. Looks pretty good. Okay, let's move on to a new type of material, one I know you've been waiting for, a dielectric that refracts. Let's start with some vector math. We need to determine the refracted vector, t. Let's write down what we know. We know the incident vector, the surface normal, and we'll also say that we know the indices of refraction for the materials, called eta and eta prime, but I'll just call them n1 and n2. We're going to normalize the incident vector, and here we're going to assume the refracted ray's length is 1. We'll see shortly if we can do this without loss of generality. As we did for vector analysis of specular reflection, we draw our vectors tip to tail from the origin. Vector A is just the incident vector reversed. And we'll write down this. Snell's law, the formula relating the angles of incidence and refraction with the indexes of refraction. With this, we have all we need to calculate the vector t. Like we did previously, we'll determine our vector's components. If we can find t-perp and t-par, we can add them together and get our result. A-perp and a-par are easy enough to find as we did for specular reflection. But check this out. The magnitude or length of a-par is just sine theta i, as the vector a is normalized with length 1. OK, so now let's look at t. Assuming t is of unit length, the length of t-par is sine theta t, whatever theta t is. And here's the heart of the whole thing. We can use Snell's law. By Snell's law, sine theta t is just n1 over n2 times sine theta i, which we can write as n1 over n2 times the magnitude of a-par. As for the actual vector, t-par is in the opposite direction of a-par. So t-par is n1 over n2 times negative a-par. We can substitute as follows. Note that a dot n is cosine theta i, the same as negative i dot n. Substituting negative i for a, we get t-par. t-perp is easier to find. Since this is a right triangle, we can find its magnitude using Pythagoras. It's in the negative n direction, so we just need to multiply with negative n, and we get our value. Of course, n is of unit length. The only thing to note is the length of t-par. As long as n1 over n2 is less than or equal to 1, t-par will never be more than 1. But if n1 over n2 is more than 1, we can find ourselves in a situation where the length of t-par is more than 1, in which case we'll be taking the square root of a negative number. This is the case when total internal reflection occurs. For now, we'll just take the absolute value of the root. We'll soon deal with total internal reflection properly. We now have both components. If we add them up, we have our refraction vector. We'll code a refract function in VEC3. I just copied Dr. Shirley's code here. We have three input parameters, the incident ray, the normal, and a ratio of the indexes of refraction. Since our spheres exist in a transparent material, we can assume a vacuum. We just need one number for the ratios of the indexes. In the function body, we calculate the parallel and perpendicular components. Note the absolute in the square root. It looks like we're ready to implement a dielectric material class and generate an image. But, as Dr. Shirley states, the hardest part to debug is the refracted ray. There are a few things we will check first. 
Recall for every ray, we look for intersection points with the closest one being the hit. We find these points in the hit method implemented by the sphere class. The method computes the roots of a quadratic to find t, a scalar we multiply to the direction vector of the ray to find the point. There could be two values, but up to now we only needed the lesser or closer value. This sphere is a dielectric. We'll find the scatter direction, and it will look like this. Now we'll try to find intersection points for this ray. There are two. The lesser t value is the one at t equals zero, which we don't count as a hit. Remember we have a range that surrounds zero and infinity to start, and zero is outside this range. So we'll update the hit function. If the lesser t value is not in range, we'll look for the greater or larger t value. If both aren't in range, it's not a hit. Let's generate our image again. We introduced a bug, it seems. We've accidentally introduced something called shadow acne. This is happening because of that second root, which is surprising since we've only ever cared about the lesser root in the first place. Let's take a look. Here's a reflective material. We calculate a reflection ray and find its intersections. There are two intersections. The lesser root is negative, and the greater root, I wrote positive here, is zero. Both are out of range. Here's a JavaScript console. What's 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1? Note it's not exactly 0 0.3. Subtracting the expected value, it's off ever so slightly by 10 to the negative 17. To quote Dr. Shirley, floating point rounding errors can cause the intersection point to be ever so slightly off. This means that the origin of the new ray the ray that is randomly scattered off of the surface is unlikely to be perfectly flush with the surface. It might be just above the surface. It might be just below the surface. If the ray's origin is just below the surface, then it could intersect with that surface again. This will attenuate the ray's color, and it could happen over and over again, possibly reaching the max depth. This explains the black pixels. The solution is actually very simple. Account for this in the range. If the t value is super small, we can assume it's because of this rounding error. Running, we see we're back. A few more things. Recall how we determine the normal vector. We find a point and get the normal vector by drawing a line from the center of the sphere to that point. We'll then do our refraction calculations get our refracted ray, and continue with the next hit. The blue incident ray is pointing at the surface, and the normal is away from the surface. This is how we calculated the refracted vector earlier. However, at the point PR, the red ray is now the incident ray, and the normal NR is pointing in the wrong direction. To do our calculation, we need to invert the normal. We can see the dot product between the red vector and normal is positive, and for the blue vector, it's negative. If the dot product is greater than zero, we will invert the normal. We'll introduce a new property for a hit, the front face, to store this information. For the blue ray, it is true, and for the red one, false. If it's false, we will invert the normal. We can now correctly calculate the refracted ray. We'll add the front face property to the hit record and set it and the normal by calling this set face normal function. We'll take the outward normal and call set face normal here. Finally, recall that to do our refraction calculation, we need a ratio of the indexes of refraction and that a dielectric is defined by its relative index. For incident rays on the sphere, this ratio is one over the relative index. For rays exiting the sphere, it's just the value of the relative index itself. 
We'll use the front face property of the hit to determine which one to use. We can now implement our dielectric material class. It takes one argument, its relative index of refraction. Here we use the front face property from the hit record to determine the refraction ratio. We find the refracted vector, set the scattered and attenuation output parameters, note we are not attenuating at all, and return true. And we're ready to see it in action. We'll make the right material dielectric with its index 1.3. Let's run and see what we get. Looks good. What do you suppose will happen if we set the index to 1? Hope that makes sense. Finally, let's deal with total internal reflection. If n1 is greater than n2, this is how things refract. The angle of refraction is greater than the angle of incidence. We can get to a critical angle of incidence where the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. We can find the sine of this angle using Snell's law. It is n2 over n1. Rewriting this, we can check if n1 sine theta1 over n2 is greater than 1. If this is the case, we will have total internal reflection. Remembering what we did earlier, the dot product of the normal and the inverse incident vector is the cosine of the angle of incidence. Using a trig identity, we can find its sine. We find these values, determine if we will have total internal reflection, and use an if statement to either reflect or refract. We can make our dielectric material even more realistic. If you've ever looked out over a lake when it's calm, or even a puddle in the street, you'll see that both reflection and refraction occur. The amount of light reflecting off an interface between two media is dependent on both the angle of incidence and the indexes of refraction. This amount, that is, the percentage of light that gets reflected, increases as the angle of incidence increases. It takes solving some complicated equations called the Fresnel equations, to find this percentage. But as Dr. Shirley notes, there is a very good approximation called Schlick's approximation that we can use. We'll create a function that takes the cosine of the angle and the index of refraction and use Schlick's approximation to return the percentage of light reflected. We'll compare this number to a random number between 0 and 1. If it's greater than the random number, we'll say the ray reflected. Generating our image, we see this effect, especially at grazing angles, when the angle of incidence is large. Here is the same image at a higher resolution. Looking good. Great job following along this far. We've created material classes, calculated refraction vectors, learned about shadow acne, and a whole lot more. See you in part four, where we'll wrap things up with a positionable camera, defocus blur, and anti-aliasing.